everyone and welcome to seller apps live stream where we talk about supplying today so china as you know is the leading um, country when it comes to supplying and we have a special guest whose name is francois jeffers from noviland and i will invite him on board in a minute so before we start our live session i have a very interesting announcement for you guys and for those of you watching right now hi i'm ria mittal and i work as a product evangelist at seller app um introduce yourselves in the chat box below i would love to um speak to you all let let's make this interactive session. session so very important announcement very exciting announcement for all of you watching right now seller app is hosting an event called go global uh, 2021 which will talk about how we can expand to different marketplaces the event starts from monday which is 5th of april super excited we're covering uh, three to four marketplaces so check that out registration link is out so you can um, book your spot right now so yes let me uh, hi lisa how's it going so let me introduce you to francois now so francois jeffers is a director of business development at noviland noviland is a supply a uh, management company supply chain management company we have had them before on uh, for a seller speak session it was really interesting you guys loved him so he is back and he has so many years of experience um talking about or managing supply chain so this is um a perfect guy to be here to talk about supply chain management so um france i'm going to put you on the screen now hello hey how's it going it's going good good morning and good morning everyone who's watching right now <laughs> Yeah, so France, yeah. What's well, yeah. nighttime for you, right? Oh yeah, it is. What time is it? It's seven o'clock in the evening for me. Oh. But <laughs> yes, I mean, it's just it's just crazy how technology has just gotten us into one place at the same time. I'm already so fascinated by things like this. And uh, Francois is also a co-host when it uh, for a podcast called Link Up Leaders. Congratulations on your podcast, Lisa is here as well. So congratulations on your post podcast. It's amazing. I have Thank watched you. a few episodes. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's been a, a a fun journey, I think, really going from uh uh being on podcasts and being able to talk and and I think, you know, a lot of those that I talked about including yourself, we had some amazing conversations. So we were like, "Well, why don't we just continue these conversations whenever we're not invited on podcasts and just have our own podcast?" Um, so it's been a great journey. Lisa's an amazing co-host. She keeps me on track, which is the most yes. important thing. So it's uh you know, I I tend to go into rabbit holes which I'm sure we're going to go into today cuz Lisa's not going to correct me um and keep me on track uh but I I'll try to keep it as on topic as possible. Oh don't worry I'm here to take over her position for today and <laughs> I completely love what Lisa and you do. I really want to co-host as well. So I get lonely here man in my room I just get lonely so I just love um what you guys do. So just introducing everyone to today's topic we are going to be talking about uh, some common mistakes that suppliers make when they are sourcing from China. So of course when an Amazon seller starts their journey uh, we see that they want to decrease their cost and increase their margins and a way of increasing margins can be to get the production cost down which is usually done by outsourcing your manufacturing so when you outsource from china uh, if you're manufacturing electronics of course china is so much cheaper for you to outsource from and of course if you're uh, looking for eco friendly products or if you're looking for handicraft products india is leading in that thank you mekla for teaching me all this information otherwise i would have been lost so yes <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for teaching me that and um Francois has so many years of experience um you know building relationships and helping sellers get the supply chain management on point so I'm sure that you know and you've seen all the mistakes that sellers do when they are supplying from China for the first time uh, hi Jose thank you for coming back so yes uh Francois let's talk a little bit about supplying from China Yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of these same principles will be able to be applied uh whether it's sourcing from India or Vietnam uh, or really anywhere else in the world. Uh, I I think the fundamentals are the most important part. Um now of course the way that you interact with all the suppliers is going to be slightly different. Um and I would highly suggest checking out, you know, Megla's show. I think it's a virtual India uh sourcing or trade show, I think. It's virtual um, India. I learned So, yeah. Yeah, I I learned a ton from her when it comes to India. So definitely I would suggest checking it out. Um her name is Megla Bardwaj and so but when it comes to sourcing in general, we can start all the way from the beginning sort of an initial Amazon seller's journey and how they're developing, you know, the product request for quotes, uh gathering all the specifications and details, thinking through packaging all the way through uh factory interactions and how to continue developing those relationships. So if anyone has questions about 
anything that I say, because I tend to talk a little quick, uh, definitely tell me to shut up and slow down or just yeah, ask you to elaborate. Um, I have no problem with that at all. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I have worked with, uh, at this point, probably thousands of, of e-commerce businesses and spoken with them about, you know, just the request for quotes or about their general projects. And um, over time, we have developed this sort of request for quote or this RFQ guideline uh, that does help them with their journey. But whenever an Amazon seller might start out, let's say they start out on Jungle Scout or Helium 10 or any of these other, uh, I, I believe Smart Scout is a new tool that's coming out uh, also uh, that, that's going to be um helping with market research, but an important thing to note is that that's just one part, you know, finding the product that you want to sell and, uh, you know, assessing your competition, uh, finding the right keywords, that is all sort of the sexy side of Amazon, right? That's the part that everyone wants to talk about, uh, but no one wants to talk about what the actual hardship of supply chain is. And so they might select an amazing product. They look at the one star reviews. They see the improvements that they can make on them. Uh, they understand, you know, um, what people like about it, what people don't like about it. Uh, maybe they could change the material slightly, or maybe they can add a complementary product uh, to make it more of a little bundle. And so they can attract more keywords. Uh, but there are struggles that come along with all these things. Uh, so it's important to, to, to keep all of this in mind. So when you're starting your journey, you pick out your product, it's important first to look at as many different products as possible and looking at those one star reviews um, and making sure that, you know, whatever people are complaining about or that they don't like about these products, you're going to be able to improve on or provide some added value or maybe even address in the listing itself uh, as to how your product is going to uh, sort of take care of these issues. Uh, but also looking at the technical specifications. So scrolling to the bottom of that Amazon listing or Googling the product. Let's say you're looking for these types of tumblers. And I've seen it far too often where someone just says, I'm looking for, you know, a metal tumbler and it has to be insulated and the top is plastic. Well, what does that mean? Right. There's thousands of tumblers out there that, you know, there and there's hundreds, I'm sure, of factories that can actually make them. Um, so it's important to note, you know, hey, I really like this design that closes and I can send you pictures and uh, some of the specifications for, you know, the the dimensions of them. Uh, if it's a screw top, understanding, you know, how thick that screw top actually is. Um, and then, you know, if it's a, a rubber handle, making sure that you understand, you know, how far down that actually is, how long should it insulate? So if it should insulate, you know, six hours or 12 hours, uh, I've seen some awesome ones out there that are like 24 hours. I'm like, how do you even do that? Um, but Perhaps factories not. are able to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I, I think it's all just uh, not necessarily a marketing ploy, but uh, a lot of it is trusting their suppliers and trusting what their suppliers will tell them. Uh, so if their supplier tells them, yes, it should cover 24 hours, sometimes they might not have tested it if they're working with a smaller supplier. Uh, but that's where understanding what, let's say, a double wall stainless steel insulation would cover, right? And understanding sort some of the mechanics behind the product. Um, <clears throat> so I always suggest that Sellers, when they're developing these specifications, they do as much research as possible, which is very boring. It's not as easy as going on Jungle Scout, not as easy as going on Helium 10 or Viral Launch or any of these market research programs, um, but it is necessary. So as you go along, you can start to make a document and that document can hold some of the different materials and, and it can hold maybe the dimensions and the colors that you're looking for. Um, including also, you know, what is the target price that you really need to get this at? If you know you have to sell it for $15, you know, do you have to source it at around three, $4? And then, you know, how much is shipping going to be? How much are FBA fees going to be? Um, so I would highly suggest Googling. I'm sure there's a few calculators out there, but Googling some of these FBA fees and, and Amazon fees that you're going to be encountering to come up with this target price. So that's one of the first things to do when you're, when you're deciding on a product. Um, then coming up with a budget. And this is something that you can definitely speak with your accountant about, but it's far too often that I do speak to new sellers and they just say, well, I have no budget. Well, what does that mean to a factory? That means, wow, this guy's going to order a container load of product because he has no budget. Um, 
So you want to make sure you're starting to set those expectations right with them. Uh, and you start to be honest and you start to come off very professional. Hey, I don't just want 500 units. I want 500 units. I want the target price to be around, you know, five to six dollars. And I have an overall budget of about four thousand dollars. And that includes shipping. Um, and so <clears throat> when you put together all these different details for them, they start to uh, assess it and say, okay, well, that's a $4,000 project. It is something that's within our range. Uh, the 5 to $6 target price, we might even be able to get them a better price with a higher MOQ than 500, let's say 750, but we can stay within that $4,000 range, right? So it's understanding all these different aspects to it uh, and your suppliers can come up with innovative solutions and they could see you as this pro, someone that's done this before. Um, so, so those are some of the, the first things to, to definitely remember. Um, and it's bringing them all the specifications. So that document that I just talked about, uh, it's coming up with, you know, hey, I want 304 stainless steel and it has to be double wall insulated and it has to have a customized logo. You don't have to tell them what the logo is going to be or what the exact design is going to be. Uh, but you have to tell them that you do require some level of customization. Uh, I think you're going to be able to weed out a lot of suppliers just by putting this together and you can save weeks of, of interacting with them um yeah so, um, yeah it's uh, you definitely have like this is why we need someone to talk about sourcing because i didn't know you could read out suppliers but just by asking for customization so i thought all the suppliers that you go to will be ready to do customization but then it's all coming back to me when you said that uh you know people, um, sellers don't even realize that they have to pay extra for the customization mold. And that's not something that your supplier is going to cover and charge. So I've, the whole conversation is coming back to me. So yeah, thank you for enlightening me. And for people who are trying to start their Amazon journey, Seller App has some really great tools that you can use. We have product research tool. We do calculate FBA fees for you. And we do oh, calculate. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and you do calculate estimated sales as well. The sales estimator is a free tool. You can use it. Uh, you just have to enter your product, the category, and it's so easy to use. If you want to understand product research for 2021, I will link a video down in the uh, comment section below or in the description below so you can check that out. So we have a product research tool. We also have a sourcing tool that you can use to get started on Amazon. If you need any more help, you can send us an email at support at the and we help you get started on Amazon as well. So yeah, that's just a little... Um, um, tweak on what seller app does also Francois make lies here she says uh oh wow i just joined and heard my name what a coincidence facebook user <laughs> that is Mekla. hi Mekla. thank you for being here we love you hey Megla. <laughs> huge fans i recommend her to just about anyone that china is not strong in so if they are talking about textiles or we had actually a few users that were requesting mango wood uh, for certain yeah. products very strong in India and realistically any suppliers are in that are in China and say, yeah, yeah, we're really good at it. We're really good at it. They're lying. They're just trying to get you hooked. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a crude honesty of it. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's something where I will tell them, Hey, let me connect you with Megala. She has a great network. Uh, so anyone that's listening 100%, if you're sourcing from India, check Megala out, check out all of her content. She, she's amazing. I hope you have her on here. Oh, you did have her on here. She is here. Not too long ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, uh, no, you had her on um, the Seller App podcast yeah, not too long ago. Oh, yeah, we had it. We had her and she spoke about um, sustainable sourcing and how right. India is leading in sustainable sourcing. So you should be like, you know, looking into that because a lot of Amazon sellers or even buyers have gone to this behavioral change where they look for ethnically sourced product and ethically made products. So yes, we have seen that change happening on Amazon. So if it's something that you're looking on uh, to sell a product in 2021 regarding eco-friendly products or, um, you know, just sourcing ethically, you should definitely check out the session we did with Mekla. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even to touch on that point, when it comes to eco-friendly or recycled material, for example, it's important to know what you want ahead of time. And before you even approach these, these suppliers, uh, because they are going to have limitations in regard to what type of material they use. And so if you're looking for an, uh, you know, recycled plastic, it might be a little bit more expensive than them just using a, a regular plastic. Sure. Why? Because they have to, you know, receive it. They have to process it. They have to turn it into resin and they have to melt that down into the plastic product itself using a mold. Um, so it's very important to understand all of these different aspects of, of what you're trying to market. Um, and that's how you find the best uh, partners and suppliers in general. Um, 
but going back to sort of the the eco friendly and and sort of the product development, um, it's I, I touched on you know the budget and the target pricing, and I touched on uh, gathering all the specifications for the product, uh, and those are amazing first steps to have uh, every single time. That's one of the first things that you should always try to develop. Uh, but you also need to take it one step further. So I think it's always important to think about packaging. Right. A lot of times I tend to see uh, an Amazon seller um, not think that through all the way to where they can't accurately calculate their FBA fees or it might price them out because of those FBA fees, uh, because it might be an oversized product or an odd shaped product. Right. And so thinking through not necessarily, again, not the design that you're going to print on that packaging, but hey, I do want this within two pieces of styrofoam or it's also known as you know eps or polystyrene expanded polystyrene and i want that in a fully customized box and that is something that the factory is going to say well okay great you want a customized box what type of printing do you want on it how many colors they, they might ask you these types of questions so they can know which partners to use also do you sure. need a heavy gloss do you need <clears throat> You know, do you want the cardboard box to just close in? Do you want it to be two pieces that kind of join together? Uh, that's all going to affect what partners they're going to be able to, to use, right? Um, and so we, kn knowing that is important and understanding product safety, right? So understanding that your product is going to go through some rough patches. It is going to be received by Amazon. Uh, they may drop your product. They may drop your master cartons. Um, you know, along the way, I'm sure everyone has seen those videos of just uh, uh, carriers and, and FedEx and UPS drivers just taking the package and just having a bad day and they toss it, right? And it lands on that front step and it's like, uh -huh. boom, cool. it's right there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so um, planning for those events is very important and, and understanding that uh, it's not all going to be, you know, daisies and roses where they're going to place it very gently and even if you have fragile on the product and a sticker that says fragile uh, they might not treat it as such uh, if you've ever seen the back of a fedex or ups truck it's usually products thrown all over the place um, and they may you know slide off as they're driving so uh, planning for that is definitely important um, and then uh, also inserts card inserts making sure that you're amazon compliant mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does provide that next level of, of sort of customer experience. Yeah. Right. But I have seen a few um, Amazon sellers where we have helped them, you know, make a quick little recommendation that they might want to change their wording. Uh, exactly. But they might say, hey, leave me a five star review and here's the link and I'll give you five dollars off. And <laughs> immediately that's a red flag. Yeah, that can get you, you know, that can have you ship it into Amazon. Amazon, someone's going to complain or your competitor's going to order it. They're going to write into Amazon. You're going to have to issue a removal order. It's going to be far more expensive than the cost of that, those few reviews that you're actually going to get. Sure. Um, so we just spoke with, um, uh, his name slips my mind. He's on Firing the Man podcast. Lisa, who is that? Firing the Man podcast. Oh, I've seen that episode of yours. I just can't yeah. remember. Yeah. <laughs> John? Firing the man. David Schomer. David Schomer. I yeah. I don't know. I, I just I was speaking with him yesterday. Uh, David Schomer, he was talking about how you can stay Amazon compliant while asking for an honest review. And you could tell a little bit more about, you know, your company background and how you're a smaller business. Um, and so I, I know, you know, on one of the podcasts that we have with him for uh, the Link Up Leaders podcast, we, we will also mm -hmm. link, you know, his... Um, his his template for what he has for a five star review. So that 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 is something else that um you know you could definitely do uh, when it comes to card inserts. But uh, and just not to skip over the card insert part because I, I see this be a, a big mistake of a lot of sellers. But that's understanding the size of it too. Understanding the paper weight and the you know it's called the GSM or the grams per square meter of that uh, paper. Understanding if you want a matte finish or a gloss finish, uh, you know, uh, understanding all these different aspects, and you can Google all these. Uh, they're they're very simple actually to Google. Hey, Ping Pong Payments, probably Ryan. How you doing? Probably <laughs> Ryan. Always Ryan. Hi Ryan. Yeah, always Ryan. Um, 
but you can, yeah, you can Google a lot of these uh, specifications when it comes to card inserts. Uh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of Google. Uh, I know Lisa is probably tired of me saying, you know, hey, just let's just Google it really quick. It's it, you can find every single answer that you're looking for, including the product specifications. Um, yeah. So it's it's important to 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 you know utilize Google or utilize you know Bing or DuckDuckGo, whatever it is that you actually use to to search. But utilizing these search engines to gather all of these details is very important. Um, and this can take a few hours. I mean, this can take. Uh, I, I've done it personally for a, a few different products just to see how long it would take, and it's taken like five six hours. Uh, not going to lie. Um, but those five, six hours can save you weeks. They, they can send you the, in regards to weeding out suppliers in regards to, um, uh, getting the best and most accurate pricing in regards to kicking off a relationship strong because you're giving them less work, right? If you come to them very prepared, they're going to say, wow, this guy is a pro. He knows exactly what he's looking for. Um, and utilize tools like Alibaba. Alibaba is amazing when it comes to technical specifications. Uh, a lot of those listers tend to just put them right at the bottom. They'll say material plastic, but you go to the next one and it might expand material plastic slash polypropylene. Um, and so you can continue utilizing all these different specifications, you know, putting them aside maybe going back to the Amazon listing and seeing, okay, what does my competitor sell? He sells a plastic and it's actually ABS. It's not polypropylene. Um, and so, okay. So now if let, let's say I do want to use polypropylene and it has uh, possibly some BPA in it. So now I have to include the prop 65 sticker uh, for, for, for California compliance. Uh, so it's all these different uh, aspects that you have to think through. And that's why it is going to take, you know, that five to 10 hours realistically just for one product. Uh, but this is an investment. Um, and if you don't want to do it, you can hire a virtual assistant. You know, you could check out Outsource School with with Nathan Hirsch uh, and, and Connor, and uh, they're, they're great people that teach you how to use VAs, uh, which they have an amazing course for. It. You know, you could check out. Uh, I believe it's uh, Creative VAA with 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 Gilad, and he runs his own uh, virtual assistant. Um, company. So, I mean, there's a lot of different tools to do this. So if your time is more valuable than gathering all these technical specs, you can always outsource as well. Yeah. And outsourcing is just easier uh, if you are planning to expand your business. So you do start outsourcing. Like I speak to a lot of Amazon sellers. Of course, outsourcing is something that people usually do when they're expanding. And I think outsourcing is also a safe way to do stuff. Like uh, recently a seller approached me and they said that I have a studio at home. I have a DSLR at home. Can I click product pictures on my own? And I'm like, you can do that and get, you know, Amazon will not approve them if something happens or you can just firsthand outsource it and save your time. So they have agreed to like outsource their pictures and stuff. So yes, before we move on to answering some questions, I see the chat box is filled with questions for you, Francois. Great. And before we do that, <laughs> I want to circle back to product inserts because I'm really passionate about it. And product inserts, if you are planning to do product insert, you can add how to leave a review on Amazon rather than leave me a review on Amazon. And you can also, if a pro if a person, wow, I just zoned out there for a second. So <laughs> Happens to me all the time. <laughs> yeah. So if your um, customer is not satisfy satisfied with your product, they can leave a ne negative review. My words, wow. So they can leave a negative review. So you can tell them that, hey, if you're not satisfied with the product, here's a 50 or 5% off coupon and you can purchase from us again, or you can write an email to this, this, this. This will prevent them from giving you a negative review. So no review is better than negative review. I feel also re received... Um, product insert, which was a coaster. So, you know, I still use it. It had like the branding on it, the company's branding on it. And I just kept it on my table. And then you keep cool. like, you know, that's so smart because you keep getting reminded of the purchase that you've done. So I think that's a really, especially coasters or something that people can use in their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. it, it makes a lot of difference. That's what I've seen. So yes, Francois, let's answer some questions. First of all, hi everyone who is there in the chat right now. What's up, Ryan? <laughs> So um, let's take some questions. So Harry, hi, Harry. Welcome back to Seller Apps Live. Can you suggest a few tips while negotiating with a supplier? This is walking on um, chips. <laughs> so I'll let Francois answer that. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, Harry, no, that's an amazing question. Um, and it's actually, uh, it, it goes directly with the topic that we wanted to talk about, which is some of the downfalls uh, with Amazon sellers. Uh, so when it comes to negotiating, that should not be your first thought when reaching out to suppliers. It should not be, hey, I have to have it for 5% cheaper, no matter what they're saying. Uh, when you're negotiating, you first of all want to come off as professional. So everything that we just talked about, you want to make sure that you have a well thought out RFQ, that you have a budget, that you have a target pricing, uh, and that that target pricing is realistic, right? If you see it everywhere on Alibaba for $2, don't tell them, hey, you want it for uh, 50 cents. Um, so going in with the negotiations, it's all about a partnership and a relationship, not just a transaction, right? You're not going to a thrift market that you can say, hey, I want this for $2 and they're going to say $5, you're going to say $3, they're going to say three fifty. It's It's not going to be like that. It's going to be, hey, you know, I really need this to get to $2. How can we achieve this? Uh, and how can we achieve this together? They see that as a lot more promising than just demanding from them, hey, you have to get this to me for $2. Uh, so, it, so some innovative ways could be instead of, you know, getting fully customized packaging the first time, just to test the market, uh, maybe get a plain brown box and you put a sticker on it. Uh, maybe instead of having you know, the, the tremendous added value to your product, which could be, you know, because it's uh, ceramic or any higher end material, maybe try you try something a little bit cheaper the first times, uh, just see how that sell. Or you can, you know, have a high end, you can have a low end type of product and you could list both those as, uh, you know, just the different quality levels of them. Um, but circling back, back around to negotiations, uh, another thing that you can always try with them is finding out what quantity they have to produce to get to that price point. Um, so again, not badgering them and telling them you have to get it to me for $2. It's, you know, hey, I want to order 500 for this test run. I understand I can't get it at $2 because you have manufacturing overhead and you have to switch out the machinery and you have to order the raw materials and their raw material suppliers have MOQs um, or minimum order quantities uh, is, is the long form of that. Um, and so when you, when you take all these things into consideration, labor cost also, taking all these things into consideration, uh, you need to realize that they might not be able to sell that to you for $2 uh, at that first time for 500 units. So how can you make that happen? So let's say they come back to you, it's a firm $3 at 500 units, there's nothing that we can do about it. Well, at $3, let's let's do this cost assessment using the seller app tool. Uh, using the seller app tool, you're able to uh, you know, see your FBA fees, and, and, and re re correct me if I'm wrong for any of this, but I, I would believe that you can see some of the FBA fees and Amazon fees that are associated with it. Is that right? Yeah, you can. Okay. I wish I could share my screen, but like, um, I lose the control over a stream. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So we do have something called profit dashboard and product intelligence. So if you go to your product intelligence, if you're using our tool, you can see everything that you need to know about your product, including your FBA fees as well. So yeah, and Amazon selling fees. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, go ahead and use seller app and find out those Amazon seller fees and FBA fees and find out at $3 with this packaging and this packaging size uh, and including my card insert and you know it's not customized packaging but I can just test the market with this product initially, see what sort of feedback I get um, and see what sort of reviews and traction I can get. Um, maybe not even include a card insert the first time. Uh, again, just truly testing out this product. And you can say at $3, I will not make the profit that I want. I'm not gonna make that 20, 30% profit for this private label product that I plan to launch and make huge. Uh, maybe I'll get closer to breaking even maybe even with giveaways, uh, maybe instead of 500, I should order 600, 700. Uh, that way I can give away more products or I can conform for some of the defects and replace those for free and deliver a better customer experience. Um, maybe I could use you know, a site like Rebate uh, and run some rebate programs for uh, those initial units. Uh, that, that way, you know, maybe they'll leave us some reviews. So, so there's all these different aspects that you need to take into consideration, not just, again, forcing them to get that $2 mark at 500 units, uh, working with them. Okay, 2,000 units, we can get to 250. What else can we do with this? Uh, can we provide some added value or some complimentary product to this mug? Maybe a coaster. Maybe a coaster would deliver a better experience, uh, and a coaster can be less than you know four or five cents. Uh, well, yeah. now let me add this to the packaging, and now let me market my product with this something that my competitors don't have, and I can charge an extra dollar. It'll make up for those fifty cents that you pay. Um, 
so it's it's not so much negotiating on the transaction it's negotiating with the relationship i i, I think that uh sort of is my answer and i hope i answer that well harry but definitely follow up and uh check in with me um if you know that doesn't work also Perfect. I think that answered quite well. So let us know in the comment section below, Harry, if that answered your question or not. Moving on to the next question, which I'm really excited about. So hi, Matthew. Um, could you explain the ways to ship products from China to Amazon's warehouse directly? Yeah, yeah. And it's um, it, it, it's actually a lot simpler uh, than most businesses think. So creating a ship, shipping plan in Amazon, they make it very simple. Uh, you create your shipping plan plan, you let them know it's going to be L because more than likely, you know, if you're not going to be a full container load. Um, so you say that it's an LTL and when you're include, you're putting your ship from address, this is a, a very big mistake that I see a lot of sellers make. They'll use their Chinese manufacturer's address uh, when in reality they could. Yeah. And it's, it, it throws everything off in the Amazon platform and, and they, you know, often assign you a, a, a funky, Amazon warehouse, or they might ask you to distribute it to a few a few different ones. Um, but your ship from address should be a local warehouse in the US or the address of a headquarters. So for example, we ask all of our users that they use our California headquarters address uh, in, in Silicon Valley because they tend to get a California warehouse when it comes to Amazon FBA. So um, Amazon does sort of assess where that ship from address is, and then they assign you uh, a designated warehouse and they may still split it up, you know, if you are new. Um, but so use that trip from address, uh, a domestic address for that. Uh, you get a higher likelihood of getting a, a local, you know, uh, fulfillment center in that, in that region. Um, and then you would, uh, you know, get your stickers. You would be able to have your master carton labels because you know the dimensions, you know the weights, you know how many units go per master carton. Uh, you'll also get your FNSKU labels from Amazon. Uh, and then you may also be getting your pallet uh, labels from Amazon. Um, you would send all of this to your supplier, the FNSKU labels, definitely. You want them to prep that for you beforehand. So let them know that ahead of time also. Uh, and then when it comes to the master cartons, that's something you can either work with your supplier or your freight forwarder. I would suggest working with your supplier because once your freight forwarder has your goods, they're not necessarily incentivized to actually prep them for you. They just want to ship them to wherever the final destination is. Um, so working with your supplier to, you know, have a set 20 units per master carton, less than 50 pounds, less than 25 inches on any side. Uh, I, I think it's 25, but I know it's definitely less than 50 pounds. Um, and so, you know, again, going back to Google, just Google Amazon FBA prep requirements. And I promise you, it'll be the first one that comes up. It says sellercentral.amazon.com, I think. And it's a whole long uh, URL, but it, it walks you through that entire process too. Um, and then from there, your, you know, your forwarder or your supplier, it depends if you're getting DDP Inco terms, uh, then your supplier would handle all the customs and, and clearance and documentation for export and import. Uh, they should be delivering it straight to the Amazon Fulfillment Center. Um, yeah. Now, depending on where that fulfillment center is, I would ask them ahead of time to also get a, a POD or a proof of delivery, um, which means they just have a quick little signature from the warehouse manager that they receive the items at the fulfillment center uh, because it could be slow to check in also right um if that answered your question matthew let us know if it did in the comment section below and thank you so much for answering that question francois there's so many things that i didn't know about and just i have another question to ask you right here so when you said that amazon like splits up your um package in the warehouses is it called a b testing by any chance to see which warehouse gets more orders or something because i feel like amazon charges for that so they don't they don't charge for splitting it up. It, it costs a seller more actually to to ship it to all three fulfillment centers because usually it's like one on the west coast, one in you know let's say in yeah. Texas, one on the east coast. So the forwarder has to you know let's say receive an entire pallet. They have to deconsolidate it. They they have to cross stock it at the warehouse and then ship it off to the three centers. And you know there's flat fees yeah. associated with all the domestic trucking. Um, so it mm -hmm. tends to be more expensive when you do it that way. But I think they tend to do it for newer sellers. And and I don't think they give the sellers an option other than to say you want to consolidate all of these in one warehouse. Uh, and then you have to pay an additional Amazon fee for that as well. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I, 
I, I would assume that they do it so they could test it. So they can say, okay, the West Coast warehouse works the best. Uh, I see this most frequently happen when a seller uses a Chinese manufacturer's address as a ship from address um, yeah. and not when they use a domestic address. Okay, so thank you for clearing that out. So let's take the next question. Um, good morning, guys. That's by Jesse. Hi, Jesse. I have a quick question. Should I keep the commercial invoices from my supplier in case of a tax audit? I would, I still keep all my like uh, invoices. <laughs> this is my purse. So, Francois, I would suggest Jesse to keep the receipts as yeah, well. What yeah, you 100%. Want. Yeah, and 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 you know if that's a, a a type of question also that you have more frequently in regards to financials, I would suggest seeking out an accountant just to consult for you for maybe the first few hours, um, and then help you set up your your accounting uh, in, in that regard, and just let you know, hey, you know, you can also digitize your invoices, so scan them, keep them on you know in a file. That way, you don't have to keep all of them logged or well organized. Uh, if you are audited, you're able to have all the different files, all the invoices is for uh, direct from your supplier, direct from um, your freight forwarder also, um, and then also from your 3PL and your fulfillment center, uh, because that is a, a business expense and a, and a cost uh, that, that you, you, know, you, you should be logging with your accountant. Amazing. Um, I hope that answered your question, Jesse. Thank you so much for answering that question. All right, so we have a few more questions. Um, if you have any more questions, let us know in the comments uh, box below. We are only going to be taking up questions which are super important and relevant to the session from now on. Uh, planning to sell an electrical item. Hi, Joseph. How can I make sure the supplier is using high quality items and not low quality ones once they deliver the product to my Amazon warehouses? So, Francois, how do we make sure that our product is of best quality? Great question. Um, and th there tends to be a lot of trust uh, associated here. And this is why it's important to not necessarily just badger them for that five, 10% off, not saying, you know, hey, I have to have this for five cents cheaper because I want it because it has to cover a certain margin. Uh, absolutely the wrong way to negotiate, which, which we just talked about. Um, every time that you do something like that, they will end up, you know, uh, changing something internally and using cheaper material or, or lower quality uh, internal components. Um, so, you know, uh, highly suggest against that pure transactional negotiation. Um, but when it comes to, you know, ensuring that they actually are shipping quality products, uh, a few ways that you can do it. One, when it comes to electronics, 100%, no matter what, you have to get a quality control inspection. Um, and you have to use a trusted QC inspector. Don't let the factory self inspect. Uh, that's a very common term. I hear a lot of sellers do it. Uh, I, I know, you know, we've had a few people on our podcast that said, you know, hey, well, we haven't inspected in over a year. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. They got very lucky. Uh, and, and, you know, it is a business expense. Also, you can cover that with your accountant. Um, but you're paying, you know, 150, 200, sometimes $300 to get these inspections. Uh, but what that does is it, uh, one, it eases your mind. You know that you're getting a, a, a quality product being shipped out. So you have to help them with key quality indicators, letting them know, you know, this is a lamp. I want you to plug in a, I don't know, 60 watt bulb and it has to, you have to I don't know, put it in and out of the outlet somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, however you would assess, you know, what is a quality product? Sure. Um, and a lot of times these companies will inspect the internal components to it. So when you're receiving your sample from them, uh, you inspect it, test it out. I always suggest trying to break it um, because that's realistically what someone is going to do. They're going to receive it and they're going to mess with it and they're going to use it the wrong way. Not everyone uses the product the same way. Uh, so I would suggest trying it in every which way, logging what makes it a quality product, what doesn't make it a quality product, um, and looking at those internal components and taking detailed pictures of them. When you have your QC inspector go and inspect that, that lot, make sure they also take pictures of those internal components. So they may take apart one or two units. Um, usually it's it's not more than you know two to five units out of 500 to 1,000 units. Uh, two to five units have them uh, open up those internal components, inspect them, uh, and then send you detailed pictures. And you can ask them, hey, plug it in, make sure it turns on, or make sure that it dispenses or make sure that, uh, what, again, whatever those quality indicators actually are. Um, and, and then
Another thing that you could do is have a portion of that lot shipped to your house or shipped to a to a U.S. domestic uh, 3PL, and they can inspect those for you. Uh, if you don't yeah. trust, you know, the inspection overseas, or you think that you know the product is getting jarred around in, in the container or whatever the case may be. Uh, so you can get a portion of those shipped directly to you. It is going to be a little bit more expensive uh, when it comes to, to shipping. Uh, but what you can also do is if you know you have defects, you can fulfill those defects directly from, from your place. Uh, you can mess around with them, make sure that out of 100 units, all 100 work. Uh, or if one or two don't work, then okay, you know that you're averaging about a one to 2% defect. Maybe on your next order with the supplier, you add that that rate in. So if you're ordering, you know, a hundred, you add in an extra one for every hundred units that you order. Um, and so th these are just a few tips. Uh, th there's no right answer uh, is the issue. There's no cookie cutter answer because every product is going to be different. Um, and testing those methods is also going to be different. Um, but samples, you know, shipping it to yourself, quality control inspections at the source, um, having, you know, additional units for returns or defects, because typically with electronics, you see a higher rate of returns and defects. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, I admittedly so have received an electronic. I'm like, this thing doesn't work. Uh, and then, you know, my girlfriend goes, well, did you read the instructions? I'm like, no, I didn't read the instructions. Read the instructions. And then I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. It works. Uh, I'll keep it. I won't return it. Um, but yeah, these are just a few solutions when it comes to electronics. Right. So we had a session with Sajak Agrawal um, specifically on quality control when it comes to supply chains. So you can definitely go on uh, YouTube and type in Sajak Agrawal and Seller App and you'll see the video that I'm talking about. He said that he spent some years in China on the quality control floor, um, you know, and he said that many quality control inspectors are supposed to spend somewhere from six to eight hours inspecting products but then they come in they spend let's say an hour or two and they right. do a really bad job in inspecting the products and then they just leave because apparently no one wants to do their job so if you want to understand how you can get better quality products uh, francois has mentioned some very good points uh, especially i really like when you said you can get that shipped to a 3pl inspector in your home country which can you know be more it can cost you quite a bit but then again it's an investment that as you said so that's something you can do and check out that video if you want more tips so moving on to the next question thank you for answering that transfer mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's by a facebook user i'm not sure if it's makla i'm not sure who it is but 1688.com con website is better for sourcing or not i've never heard of this website what about you francois yeah, 1688 tends to be more of a domestic website uh, that a lot of uh, uh, Chinese citizens uh, within mainland China use to, to buy products. Um, and you could find some amazing trade agents and even a few, uh, actually a lot of manufacturers on there. Um, now, you need to keep in mind that these are manufacturers and trade agents that are typically catering to the Chinese market. Right. So you need to make sure that if you have certain specifications, like a T-shirt needs to be large or, you know, it's plastic, make sure that you have you you tell them, hey, this has to be ABS plastic grade A or just make sure they can meet all the different certifications and requirements. Uh, I would also highly suggest using a sourcing agent to interact with these uh, suppliers on 1688. Uh, so sourcing agents can be a huge asset. I, I know some people just see it as they're eating into my margin. Uh, but two things that I can say to that. One, they help you uh, scale up. Uh, so they can help you, you know, outsource a lot of your operations. Uh, and two, they can be your reliable partner overseas, right? They can be your boots on the ground. They can help you understand the, the culture a bit better. Uh, they can sort of take away what the factory or the manufacturer or the trade agent says, and they can interpret it correctly. So if the just a factory saying, yes, I will abide by your 10%, uh, you know, discount because that's what you want, what they might think is, okay, well, what are you going to do to get to that 10% off? <laughs> like, how are you going to reduce that price? Because most yep. factories don't have these large of margins. Um, so they might look a little bit more into them. They might find out it's a trade agent. So they have a bit more margin that they typically tack on. Uh, or they might say, hey, factory XYZ, how are you going to do this? Um, and the factory is going to say, well, you just said you wanted 10% off. So I'm getting you your 10% off. But by the way, we are using a cheaper grade of plastic uh, and we are going to use, you know, I don't know, smaller components. Um, 
and that can help you, you know, uh, your speed to market rapidly uh, by using a sourcing agent, um, particularly when it comes to sites like like 1688 or DHgate, um, which are great you know, sources and tools that you can also use. Um, or you can use a sourcing company and skip all of that. Like Noviland <laughs> had to plug ourselves in there for a second. <laughs> yes, I think it's way better because even when you're doing your listing optimization, I'm speaking from um, listing optimization point of view. When you're translating listings for different marketplaces, it's you know you can either use Google Translate, but a lot of meaning is lost in translation. So it's better you um, hire someone and outsource an agent who speaks that native language, so they the the meaning is translated one on one, so nothing is lost in between. So this is what right. I suggest I'm, I'm sure that it's the same thing when it comes to sourcing as well because translation is a very tricky subject right yeah yeah and having a, you know someone that that can be your champion right they, they can be your your partner in crime when it comes to sourcing and they can help you get those better deals you know you're, you might be paying uh five percent on top of whatever you're getting from that factory but they're probably able to negotiate better terms uh better prices better materials better quality uh, and the factory appreciates it because they're like, well, you know, hey, you speak Mandarin. I speak Mandarin. We can actually communicate. Right. I don't have to wait an yeah. entire night um, to, you know, make a decision. Uh, so, so there's a lot of benefits that also come along with it. All right. Thank you so much for answering that, Francois. And we are going to take two more questions before ending the session. Because, to be honest, it's almost 8 p.m. here. <laughs> and I'm... Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It time flies by when you're having fun. All right, Jose. So, Francois, hi, Ria. Um, I want to know if it's better to do packaging with the manufacturer or should I package it after it arrives in my country? This is something that I wanted to talk about as well. So, thank you for asking that question. Um, what, like, I spoke about this with Mekla as well, and I see that she's still here. Hi, Mekla. So, um, when we talk about eco friendly packaging, and this is a dilemma that a lot of Amazon sellers face that, you know, their package, their packaging, uh, their product is eco friendly, but then Amazon expects them to put them in the cardboard box and then ship it to someone else. So it's like a lot of wastage. So this is a lot, uh, this is a dilemma that most of the sellers who are selling eco friendly products face on Amazon. So I just wanted to plug that in there, Francois. So yes, coming back to the question, do you want to do the packaging with the manufacturer? Should I package it right when it arrives in my country? What do you suggest? Yeah, I think it, uh, it it really depends. So if your product is a very small product and it requires larger packaging, uh, then you could save tremendously on shipping costs when it comes to just shipping them in a master carton and then using a 3PL to package them for you. Um, the vast majority of the companies that we work with tend to just have it all uh, packaged at the manufacturer uh, because then they can, you know, uh, actually protect the item during transport. They are paying a little bit more when it comes to, you know, the volume within the containers, uh, but they can also prep them. So they include those FNSKU labels. They include those master cartons and the master carton labels, and they make sure that they're uh, FBA compliant uh, for shipping directly in FBA. So. I think it's a very personal question and it's something that you would have to assess what are the benefits and what are the cons uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, packaging within your own country rather than packaging at the source. Right. And if I had to answer this question, I would say that packaging with manufacturer is going to cost you a bit more, but that's the safer way to go. You don't have to worry about it's an extra step that you will not have to worry about once the package or your product leaves the country as well. And if you're shipping it directly to the Amazon warehouse, of course, like packaging with the manufacturer make more sense, if I'm not wrong. Right. Yeah. I mean, packaging with the factory is going to typically make more sense. And the, the boxes, you know, in China, for example, uh, I know, you know, raw material prices have gone up recently, uh, but they are still cheaper than having a 3PL print custom boxes for you. And then them having to invest the manpower to, to package them and uh, then MasterCard in them. It, it's, it's a long process. And you're going to be paying domestic prices. So, uh, you know, you could take advantage of the lower labor costs overseas, whether that's in China or in India as well. Perfect. So coming to the next question. Um, hi, Atharsha. Thank you for uh, thank you for being here. Uh, what is the best loan strategy? Uh, I can go on and on talking about the best loan strategy. I'll let you take strategy. this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so 
I'm actually not going to answer this question because we already have a video that covers it. So it's uh, we did a video with Chris Rawlings and he did uh, a video on the best launch strategy for your product. So go look it up. I will add that to the description once the live is over so you can go check it out for yourself. But this is a perfect time to launch your product. And this is I'm glad that you're looking for perfect launch strategies now. So congratulations on your new product, Athar. Right. So um, the next question is by Facebook user. It's in all caps. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to yell this question out, uh, but I will try. What is Amazon invoice defect rate and why is it so important, Francois? Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure that I completely understand the question. Um, I know Amazon puts a limit within certain categories for how many can be defective. So I suggest checking in your category and seeing what that defect rate allowance is. Um, I, I don't think that's the same as just the return rate. Uh, so, so I would make sure I, I, I Google both of those. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be able to effectively answer why it's so important. But uh, if, if I understand it by the other side, you know, why is limiting defects so important uh then of course you know you're delivering a, a, a not so positive experience for amazon customers and uh, it's all about that flywheel right amazon's trying to get the best uh, prices best quality best everything to their customers they increase that um that customer base and then they're going to increase their supplier base and then just sort of join these two together so uh, that's why defect rate i guess is so important all right. Uh, thank you so much for attempting to answer that, Francois. Mekla is here and she says a good sourcing company like Noviland can be worth their weight in gold. That is super. Thank super you, Megla. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to give this time to you, Francois. I'm going to give you, let's say, less than a minute to talk about what Noviland is and how you help sellers. Till then, I'll make sure that the link is in the description for the launch strategy. Go. <laughs> Yeah, so Noviland is a full stack sourcing supply chain solution all the way from, uh, you know, new sellers through very established e-commerce sellers are able to submit their request for a quote or their RFQ, uh, gathering all the product specifications and details and everything that we went over actually in this video is something that we would talk about in that initial onboarding call also. Uh, but we, you know, work with you, we get the quotes, we get, uh, we coordinate samples sample consolidation, sample notes, uh, and then we also handle all fact communications, all factory oversight for production, for uh, you know production uh, updates. Uh, we also handle logistics and getting you real-time shipping updates. So um, and, and shipping costs. So if you're you know ordering a thousand units or you're ordering five thousand units, you're able to see what those differences in shipping are actually going to be. You're going to see what the import duties are also going to be. Um, and we do all of this in a centralized tool. So uh, if you were to go to noviland.com or novi land.com uh, you are able to sign up for free submit a free rfq we'll get quotes we have thousands of factories in our network currently uh, now caveat to that doesn't mean we have every factory in the world right so we should just be seen as an added tool to whatever it is you're looking to source but we can get very competitive factory pricing um, while handling the entire sourcing and supply chain for you uh, so you, you can continue sort of uh, focusing on on that next product on uh, uh, product expansion on optimizing your listings and ppc uh, we could take care of all the grunt work in the back end of, uh, of the sourcing quality control and logistics for you perfect so that's noviland for you in a just uh thank you so much for answering that francois thank you so much for being here this was a very amazing session i had so much fun with you i hope everyone uh watching right now had fun as well let us know in the comment section below if you enjoyed the session this is francois i'm ria and thank you so much for being here Bye bye